All right, we're back in Revelation. We're uh, looking at the seven churches in the book of Revelation that God speaks to. And I believe God is speaking to us today uh, through these churches and through what he had to say to these churches. And we can glean things that will help us as we seek to be the church today in the hour in which we live. We've looked already at the first church at Ephesus. Uh, last, uh, last week we looked at the second church, uh, the church of Smyrna. And this week we're going to look at the church in Pergamum. Ephesus, if you remember, was commended for their good works, uh, their orthodoxy. They stood against false teaching. Uh, but he said, I have this against you. You've lost the love you had for me in the beginning. In other words, that uh, when you first came to know me that kind of love you've lost that kind of love and that was a problem for God and then uh, also we looked at Smyrna Smyrna was a church that was not rebuked or he said I don't have anything against you he commended them in every way and then he even encouraged them um, in their tribulation and remember we talked about the, the reality that you can do everything right and still suffer and still go through difficulty and so now we come to the church at Pergamum maybe your translation will say Pergamus uh, whichever way it's spelled is irrelevant to where it's at uh, the real place Pergamum Pergamum was a capital city uh, that was different than a lot of the other Roman uh, cities of the Roman Empire because Pergamum was never conquered by the, by Rome uh, they actually when their monarch died they were kind of an area that had their own monarch and when he died uh, they kind of willed themselves, if you will, into the Roman Empire. And because of that, Rome made Pergamum, Pergamus, a, a, a capital in that area of Asia Minor that they were in. And uh, so it was a capital of the, of the Asia province. But uh, spiritually, uh, it was more than just a provincial capital city. So let's look in Revelation chapter 2. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you will. And uh, then let's stand together. As we read the Word of God, Revelation chapter 2, uh, beginning at verse 12. This is what the Bible says. To the, to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also, verse 15, so also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore... Repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Let's pray. Father, uh, we invite your spirit to speak to us through your word today, Father. We look to your word as an authority in our life, God, as a standard of holiness for us, Lord. And we pray today, Father, that through your divine power, the sacrifice, but also the resurrection of Jesus, Lord, that you would call us as your people to that divine standard that's beyond our grasp by ourselves, but with you all things are possible. So, Lord, may you call us into the fullness of who you are through your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You could be seated. Pergamum. Uh, and, and listen to the, the description that God gives to this uh, prestigious city, Pergamus, the capital of Asia Minor. He gives them this description. He says, I know where you dwell. He's talking to the church now. To the church, I know where you dwell He's talking to their surroundings, where Satan's throne is. And he goes on to say, where Satan himself dwells. Man, that's a terrible description for any city, any place. This is where Satan's throne is, the seat of his power, the, the place of Satan's authority. 
And in fact, he says, let me just be clear. Satan dwells there. I know that the enemy has influence and power and authority. Now, there's a lot of places uh, that the names in the Bible of these different cities evoke from us responses. In other words, they evoke within us uh, some kind of reality that, hey, wow, you know, these places, these cities are bad places. For example, if I tell you a town, a city, a couple cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, we typically talk about them together. When you talk about those cities, what immediately you think, wow, that's a bad place. There's sinful things going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, but there, I, I'm just, you'll be hard-pressed to find a worse description of a city biblically than the, the description that God gives to Pergamum when he says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, where Satan dwells. That's, that's where this church is existing. This is what the church has to put up with, where Satan is, where Satan has his power, not where Satan visits, not where Satan even is, is doing some things, but this is where his throne is. This is where he dwells. This is his home court advantage. Uh, now, why? Why would God give that description? Well, there's, there may be multiple reasons. Uh, we do know that uh, Pergamum being the capital of Asia Minor and kind of a a, uh, a central location for Roman authority, and c with Roman rule and authority comes Rome's religion, all right? And so there's much paganism that takes place. There's idols and temples, uh, other gods, and, and uh, the worship of other gods. And many of these pagan gods, um, they, they mix uh, sex with the worship of their gods. So there were temples, but there were also temple prostitutes and, and a lot of things that were kind of mixed into this, uh, sexual orgies that were mixed into this um, uh, worship of these pagan gods. That was probably part of it. By the way, um, I'm going to make a little bit of a side note, but really it's in the theme of the Scripture here, is that uh, uh, one of the, the standard things about false teachings is a distortion of godly, biblical, holy sexuality. And th that always is true of, of any kind of paganism or any kind of cultic, uh, cult perspective on sexuality, but it's also true of the culture which we live in that doesn't necessarily do it in the name of a, of a pagan god, but it certainly do it in the name of humanism. In other words, you, you just have sex with whoever, or whenever, however you want to do it, and uh, it doesn't matter. But that is a kind of worship and deifying of sexuality, and it's a problem. And so whatever other issues there may be, uh, this, these things are taking place. And uh, whatever the, the reason, whether it be a long list of reasons or a short list of reasons, uh, this is a bad place. But in the middle of where Satan's throne is, where Satan dwells, the Bible says, Satan dwells, his power, his authority, he has the most influence. In the middle of all that, there's a church in Pergamum, in Pergamus. And the church in Pergamus is alive and well. It's doing good. They're growing. They've not wavered. They're faithful. They're committed to Christ. In the most wicked place described in Scripture, where Satan's throne is, where Satan dwells, there is the body of Christ being faithful. That's, that's good news. I, I think you ought to amen that. Praise the Lord that in the midst of an evil and perverse and fallen area that can best be described as the very place where Satan dwells. His home court advantage is right there. And yet right there in that place, there is a church that is being faithful to God when it comes to the lifestyle of Christ, uh, that Christians are called to, when it comes to the ethic and uh, the thought processes and, and the way of life and the love of Christ in them, uh, they are living out what it means to serve and honor and bring glory to Jesus Christ even in the worst context imaginable. The church was alive. And it was not just surviving. It was thriving. Oh, that the church today would stop being the underdog. Oh, that the church today would get beyond and get past this mentality of, oh, we're not going to make it. I hope we can make it. I hope we can just get a few more people and, and all this. this uh, what a defeatism mentality. What if we had the mentality of the church at Pergamum that, yeah, okay, Satan's doing a lot in the world. There's bad things going on around us. Evil is everywhere around us. But even if we are right there where Satan's throne is, 
we can still be God's people. We can still live differently. We can still be a holy people by the grace and the power of God. Praise the Lord. And that's praiseworthy. That's good news for us. So Pergamum, the, the Christians at Pergamus uh, give us a model for living in a culture and in a time that when we are experiencing a falling away, when we are experiencing a shift in culture away from biblical values or truth to humanistic secularization and certainly evil. We can still be faithful and true. You can still be faithful and true. Church in our culture has trouble even surviving with all the blessings and liberties we have. We have difficulty maintaining our focus upon Jesus, even though we have so many freedoms. The bigger question, though, is can, not, not can we survive when we have so many freedoms, when we have so many liberties, but the real question is can we survive can we live for Christ even if we're right there where Satan dwells? Right there where his throne is. Right there in the middle of all those things. Can we still be faithful? Uh, I, the answer is yes. I, I, I mentioned earlier and before about the fact that the, the church that is persecuted, the church that is persecuted, uh, uh, when, when God's people are persecuted, it does little to hamper the church, and the church actually grows more in persecution than it does in freedoms. You know, we're struggling in the United States and Canada, North America, Europe, and those kind of places where there's the most freedoms for, for Christians to worship and, and do uh, live their life and, and all that kind of thing. We, uh, that, that's where the churches are struggling. It doesn't make any sense to us in the natural. In the spiritual, it begins to make sense because in those places where the church is persecuted, the Christians are relying more and more on the Spirit and the power of God's Spirit to help them remain faithful in the midst of the fact that they are facing tribulation, that they are facing difficulties, that they are facing the, the negative influences. And look, look how Christ describes himself to the church here. He says, The words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword... Hey, this is a God who is going to be victorious. No matter where you live, you can live right next door to Satan himself. And I want you to know, so we serve a God who will be victorious over Satan, over evil, over sin. He's overcome all those things. He's overcome death, even, praise be to God, in the resurrection. And this is the God that we serve. This is the God who's working in our lives. We have absolutely no reason to compromise the truth of Jesus Christ, the lifestyle of holiness, we have no reason to compromise that, no matter what context we might find ourselves. Amen? Amen. No, no reason to compromise those things. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, uh, Jesus is talking to Peter. He says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, he's, it's the name, uh, the, the, his name, uh, Cephas, means rock. He's, he's playing on his name. On this rock... I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Praise the Lord. Go forth. When you go to work on Monday, when you go to school on Monday, when you go out in the neighborhood on Monday, wherever you find yourself on Monday, even in your home, just know that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. God, God is victorious, and we can walk with him even where Satan's throne is, even where Satan dwells. The church has become defensive. We're always trying to play the defensive now. We're trying to guard ourselves. We're trying to defend our faith. I want you to know something. God doesn't need you to defend him. All right? Now, the Bible talks about giving a reason for the faith which, which lies within you. You know, why are you following Jesus, really? What do you really believe about God, according to the Word? Do you, are you aware? Are you learning? Are you growing in those kinds of areas? But here's the thing. You don't have to defend God. God can take care of Himself. You don't have to defend Him. Just be light. Just be a voice, a witness for what God's done in your life. God doesn't need you to defend Him. He can take care of Himself. See, the gates of hell will not overcome God. They'll not overcome His kingdom. They'll not overcome even His people. Hallelujah. It, won't, it just won't happen. It's time for the church to move into Satan's neighborhood. It's time for God's people to begin to be bold again. Say, well, I've got to protect my rights. Don't worry about your rights. 
You worry about the calling of God on your life. You worry about where God is leading you and directing you and what he wants you to do. And he'll take care of everything else. Because he's saying, I don't care. I need somebody to go right into Satan's backyard. I want somebody to go right into Satan's throne room. And right there in Satan's throne room, establish the kingdom of heaven. Establish a, 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 an outpost. Establish a, 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 a place where there is holy ground because because there are people who are committed to living for God, committed to doing the work of God, committed to seeing God's mission fulfilled in the world. Hallelujah. We need more Christians. Praise the Lord. We need more Christians who are willing to take that stand, willing to have that kind of boldness to say, I'll be like the church in Pergamum. I'll be like those Christians from Pergamos. I will go where Satan dwells because I believe greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I believe that God's grace is sufficient. And there are people who are under the authority of the enemy in our world. They are under the, the authority and the power of sin and the, they're in bondage to the enemy. But I believe that Jesus Christ can set them free. Hallelujah. And so I'm willing to go. You say, well, you don't know what kind of place that I work, preacher. It's bad. People tell dirty jokes. They talk bad. They treat each other bad. They do terrible things. And, hey, well, maybe Satan's got a throne there, but God wants to send his church there to shine light in the dark places. Hallelujah. You say, you don't understand the classrooms that I sit in and what the teachers say and what the other students are doing and what's being taught and what's going on. But I'm telling you today, even if Satan dwells there, even if he's in that classroom, know this today that God wants to establish light in a dark place hallelujah you say you don't know what kind of family i come from you don't know what i have to deal with at home with my spouse or my kids with my parents or whatever the case may be and what i'm telling you today is be like the christians at pergamum right there where satan dwells right there where satan's moving satan's doing things he's causing hardship he's causing heartache and he's trying to bind people up you be the light in that place greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world Praise God. Uh, there's a, uh, there's a, often times that I wonder, what, what's holding us back? What's holding the church back? Uh, maybe we're playing the defensive game. Maybe we're there. And, but I want you to know something today. When we talk about holiness in God's church, holiness is not about holdout. Holiness is not about going down in the ground in a bunker and hoping that you can make it until Jesus comes back. Holiness is about taking something so powerful and so good and so pure and the love of God out into the world and believing that our holiness will not be tainted when we interact with the world because we work with people who are lost or we're related to people with lost or we're neighbors with people who are lost or we, we shop with people who are broken and sinful and whatever the case may be. We, we believe that holiness is not hold out, but it is He healing for all that are exposed to the power of God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. There's a lot of false teaching that goes around. Do you know what you believe? What you believe matters because what you believe affects how you live. If there are certain things you don't believe, there's certain things you won't do. If there are certain things that you do believe, there are certain things that you will do because of those beliefs. Your, what you really believe affects your actions. So see, folks say, well, I just, I'm limited to sin, but I love God. No, you don't love God because if you love God, you wouldn't keep doing those things. You would uh, reject those things. You'd, you'd repent of those things. You'd fight against those things. You would have a disdain for the sinful things that's going on in your life instead of uh, giving them room. And so he talks in, to the church there. He says, here's the problem. You're allowing the teachings of the Nicolaitans and you tolerate that stuff. And, and I, I want you to know the, the word of the hour of our culture is tolerate. We all want to tolerate. We want to tolerate everything. But I want you to know something. There's a lot of false teachings and there's false religions. There's only one way to heaven and it's through Jesus Christ and God's people ought to stand up resolute not because we hate other people of other religions but because we love all people to say there is a way and it's a true way and it's a real way and there's only one way and it's Jesus Christ our Lord and we've got to be serious about walking in that way and if you're going to be serious about it you're going to have to get on board with what God has to speak to you 
Get in Sunday school. Get in uh, an equipped group. Get in a place where you are learning and feasting on the Word of God. You've got to be there. You've got to get into it. You've got to embrace those kinds of things in your life. Because if you do not do that, you'll be led astray by every false doctrine that comes along the way. You just will. It's just a reality. Uh, little is known about uh, the Nicolaitans, really. Um, uh, and there's a much... Uh, uh, conjecture about them and some people say but he does deal in verse 14 with two components that is that food sacrificed to idols and practice of sexual immorality food sacrificed to idols because it, there was almost a religious experience so they get this these uh, this food uh, animals meat sacrificed to pagan gods and if it was the pagan god of of power they felt like well if I eat that meat I'll become more powerful or the, or the pagan god of intellect well, if I eat that meat sacrificed to that god then I'll become more intelligent and those kind of things and he's saying man that's you're going the wrong way but you know there's a lot of people do that today they look at their horoscope they carry around a, a, a lucky rabbit's foot and hey you know what it wasn't very lucky for the rabbit was it but we, we do all that and we just play right into it and we don't all oh, pastor that's just not a big deal but the problem is when you begin to believe in a power of something that doesn't have any real power or it's a power outside of the power of God you're trusting in the wrong thing and you're replacing Jesus with an idol however small it might be get rid of that junk push all that stuff aside going to palm readers and calling 1-800 tell my fortune all that kind of stuff that's garbage it's pagan stuff that we need to get out of the church we need to get back to the place where we're saying, you know what? We live in a time and a culture where, man, we're dwelling right here where Satan is. Uh, let me tell you a story. I, uh, when I, a uh, uh, church that I pastored previously, there, I was visiting with uh, a grandmother and her daughter, and uh, they, they're actually, the granddaughter lived there too. So they were all adults at this point. They're all over 18, but, and uh, I was visiting with them one day, and there were, uh, there were some, uh, drug addiction issues in that family the grandmother was serving the Lord and, and uh, the mother was kind of in and out and things but anyway the, uh, I was busy with them and the granddaughter was I was where she's at and I said oh pastor she's left and she's gone and she's staying with the drug dealer and, and she's selling herself for, for drugs and um, she began to share with me and they were crying and stuff and I said well where where is this drug dealer do you know where he lives yeah we know where he lives we know where she's at but she won't come home and I said well I'll go get her I'll go get her. And they're like, oh, no, no, preacher, we don't want you to do that because if you do that, they'll, they'll, uh, uh, you know, that guy will shoot you or something. And I said, well, I'm not, just tell me where they're at. I'll go over there and I'll get her. I'll bring her home. I'll, you know, I'll do whatever I can to help her. She needs to get out of that circumstance, get out of that situation. I said, no, man, that guy's a rough guy. He's a terrible guy. He, he'd shoot you. He'd kill you. And I said, well, try to shoot me. You're going like, you know, at that. He, could, he couldn't hit me. And, uh, but you know what? I just come to the point. I mean, maybe you could, you could call this foolishness. You could call me ignorant. You could call me whatever you want to call me. But I just believe that some more Christians need to step up and go to the dark places and risk something for the kingdom and for people who are bound up. So eventually I told them they weren't going to tell me where she was at. And so I, I left and I was, I was heading back home and, or wherever I was heading next. And, and uh, got a call about 10, 15 minutes later. And she said, are you serious about that, Pastor? You'd go up there and try to get our my daughter back and I said yeah I'll go up there you tell me where she's at I'll go get her and um, and so uh, they told me they gave me the address so I went over there knocked on the door guy answered the door and um, he kind of looked me up and down and I didn't look like his normal clientele I guess and uh, what do you want you know he said I said well there's so-and-so is is here and and I'm I'm here to pick her up and take her home and he was like she ain't here slammed the door and uh, knocked on the door again and, and what do you want and when he came back to the door the second time and I said I'm 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 um, looking for so-and-so I know she's here I'm her pastor I'm here to take her home and so he slammed the door again in my face knocked again no answer it's gonna be like the persistent way to just keep on knocking but uh, so I knocked a little bit and then I went back over to my car parked in the street and I thought, well what am I gonna do came over here talking all big like I was going to do something special and now I got here and boom, the guy just slammed the door in my face. What am I going to do? So it just possessed me at some point. I was sit, got in my car, I was getting ready to go and it just possessed me. Um, I, the Holy Spirit, I think, just led and said, hey, 
come on, I'm just going to praise the Lord out here. So I opened up, my, I had a Bible in my car, and I opened it up to the Psalms, one of the Psalms, and I just started reading out loud in front of this guy's house, right there on the side, I'm standing on the sidewalk, reading the Scripture and, and, uh, and, and le reading it so they could hear it inside. And I don't know how long I had done that. Uh, you know, uh, nobody had come out, nobody had said anything, or people were kind of driving by on the street sometime, and, but nobody, had, I didn't see anybody looking at me through the curtains or whatever. And uh, after I'd been there for a few minutes, all of a sudden uh, a police cruiser pulls up in front of I'm thinking, oh no, well, how am I going to explain what's going on here? And he pulls up, gets out of his car, and, and uh, starts asking me all the, you know, the routine, hey, sir, what, what are you doing out here? What's going on? What's your name? You know, can I see your ID? All that kind of stuff. And, and we start talking, and he said, what are you doing out here? And I, and I said, well, you really want to know? He said, yeah, I do. And so I, I started to tell him, I said, hey, I'm a pastor, and there's a, there's a lady in there that's connected to, a, to the church that I pastor. Her family comes to our church. And she's on drugs, and I'm trying to get her out. This guy deals drugs, and I'm trying to get him out of there. And he said, well, we just got a call from this house. They called the police on you. <laughs> and I said, for real? They called, the drug dealer called the police on the pastor. All right? That didn't even make any sense. And he said, yeah. I said, well, what did he call the police for me? He said, well, you, he got you for disturbing the peace. You know, well, I'm sure it was disturbing what, pe what he thought was peace in his mind when I was out front reading from Scripture because all of his clientele probably pull up and think, well, I don't want to get out now. There's some dude out here reading the Bible, and, and i got to get out of here. And so maybe it was hurting his business. I don't know what. And uh, just disturbing him or maybe the Holy Spirit speaking to him and, and, and causing uh, him to be con feel convicted about what he's doing and his lifestyle and things. And, and so he, he calls the, po the police and, and turns me in, and, and uh, they come out here and so the guy finally the police officer who's talking to me goes and uh, he says will you stay right here by your car over here on the sidewalk I'm gonna go talk to the guy so he goes up knocks on the door talks to the guy apparently talked to talk to the girl as well and, and he comes back to me and said hey listen there's nothing I can do I've talked to the girl she's there but she's there of her own free will nobody's holding her against her will I can't make her leave she doesn't want to see you she doesn't want to talk to you and you know those kinds of things and and so I'm I'm starting to feel more and more defeated you know, I just felt, had felt strongly, you know, the Lord wants me to come over here. And, and then this is where the, man, just, I got my second win. Because he looks at me and he says, well, he says, uh, I can't do anything, make them come, uh, make her leave that house. But he said, I'm not going to make you leave either. And he said, I'm going to park down here for a few minutes. I'm not going to stay here for very long because I've got other things I've got to do. But he said, and I'll keep an eye on you. But he said, no, this is a dangerous neighborhood. But he said, you could stay here as long as you want, as long as you don't go in their yard, you don't knock on their door, you don't mess with them in any way. You sit right here on this sidewalk and walk back and forth, and you can read that scripture, and you're fine. You just do what you're doing. Uh, but know that it's, it's dangerous out here. And I said, no problem, officer, no problem at all. And so I walked back and forth on that sidewalk in front of that guy's house. I don't know how long more I read. It felt like a long time, probably maybe 10 minutes, 15 minutes more that I walked back and forth reading that scripture. And, and I felt sure at any moment that girl's going to come walking out that door and she's going to say, Pastor, get me out of here. I need to get right with Jesus. Now, I wish that I could tell you that happened that day, but it didn't. But I will tell you one thing that happened that in the moment it was very awkward. I tell you, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't natural. It wasn't like preaching in church. It wasn't being around good Christian people and all that kind of stuff. It was really awkward. It was really uh, uncomfortable in some ways. But I'll tell you what happened. I went right where Satan dwells, right where Satan's throne was, and I laid claim to that ground being holy ground. And I think it's about time the church of Jesus Christ today, you, my brothers and sisters of Christ, begin to go where Satan dwells, where Satan has authority, where Satan has influence, and start to say, we're taking this place for Jesus. We're taking back those people who, who have been harmed and broken and scarred and chained up by sin, and we're going to point them to Jesus because in Jesus Christ, they can be redeemed so I simply say to you the church today what I say to you today is simply this even if Satan dwells where you're at you can be faithful and you set up shop for the kingdom you are ambassadors of Jesus Christ in the world and everywhere you go the kingdom of God goes with you and the kingdom of God 
is always greater. It's always greater than the kingdom and the kingdoms of this world. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. So the question that you have to face this morning is, am I going to continue to be an underdog? Am I going to continue to have a defeated mentality? Am I going to continue to worry? Oh, I don't know if I'll make it. I don't know if the church is going to survive. Oh, with all the things changing in the world, I just don't know how we're ever going to do ministry anymore. People aren't the same. People don't do these. Are we going to continue to have that defeated mentality? Or are you going to recognize that God's church can flourish right where Satan's throne is, right where Satan dwells? God's people can flourish and thrive by the grace of God. And the power of Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me? Would you stand with me today?